Hello, Cornerstone. I'm going to presume everybody just said hello. There's going to be a lot of assumptions on my point, on my part here. So, uh, but it is good to see you all uh, in this capacity. Even this is not exactly how I envisioned um, <laughs> my triumphant return uh, to Champaign Urbana, uh, but uh, it is what it is. And at least I'm grateful uh, through technology for the ability to to sort of to be here halfway, I guess, as it were, to be here virtually. Um, Okay, let me just get my stuff organized here. I've got three separate computers going. It feels a little bit like NASA here. <laughs> I knew this would be a little different and a little awkward. Uh, so I put my jokes up front and I'll just presume you laughed at them and then I'll get on to the serious stuff instead of interspersing them throughout the sermon and not knowing. Um, so just so you know, I've got a plan uh, uh, to work through this. Uh, I'm actually going to be, I'm not going to be in the book of Revelation. Um, I just found that being away for as long as I have, and then COVID, I got too much out of that headspace, as it were, too much away from the book, and I want to take another week to get back into it before uh, preaching on it. I think we only have two, maybe three sermons um, at most left in the book of Revelation, and then uh, we'll see where the Lord uh, takes us next. Although I've, I've had a thought, uh, maybe the book of Proverbs, uh, that's crossed my mind, not the whole book, but portions of it. Um, that's crossed my mind a couple times, but um, as always, if you in your prayer time, you feel like there's something that maybe the Lord wants us to look at in the Bible, um, let me know. Um, let's see here. So we're going to be doing actually Psalm 91, uh, sort of. Um, actually, this sermon is uh, um, somewhere between a sermon and a sharing time. Actually, I would say it's it's more of a sharing time than a sermon in, in many ways, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and read uh, Psalm 91 and then um, uh, jump into what it is I want to talk about. So give me a second here. <clears throat> oh, jeez. I'm sorry, my window just closed on me here. Oh, hold on just a second. Ah, you know what? Uh, Doug, would you mind getting up to the podium and just reading Psalm 91 for me, as opposed to me trying to reopen Bible Gateway again? Sorry about that. And then we'll go from there. It should be on the PowerPoint up on, on the computer as well. Thanks, Doug. Okay, Psalm 91. Whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra you will trample the great lion and the serpent. Because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Thank you, Doug. That was a Psalm that actually um, the Lord gave to me uh, one morning Oh, I don't know, a few days, a week or so before I, I uh, went on vacation on my trip. And one morning, it just uh, the Lord led my hand and my eyes to it. And it's uh, meant a lot to me uh, through the, the last couple of weeks. I've been reflecting on it last three weeks now. Um, and so I want to talk a little bit about that. And I'm going to start by talking a little bit about the trip uh, that I took. So for those of you who don't know, some of you know, some of you don't, but I uh, took a very long, I think the longest vacation uh, of my life, I think, um, here recently. 
Uh, and uh, the first part of it was the um, with Jason Peterson, who I see over here on my left, uh, and uh, uh, was uh, hiking through the West Coast Trail on Vancouver Island, uh, a very rugged trail in Canada. That was um, <clears throat> four nights and five days of hiking. And the second part was a cruise to Alaska um, from Vancouver up to Alaska and then back again. Two very different trips in style and substance uh, that were back to back. And I did push myself, my body, uh, to certain limits on this trip that I had never pushed it to before. And I am, of course, referring to the buffet bar at the Alaskan cruise ship. Did that one land? I can't tell. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, oh, okay. Uh, but a, a part of me did actually, uh, on, on, the, uh, on the West Coast Trail, hiking with Jason, uh, a part of me did actually die out there. Uh, but the doctor says the toenail will grow back again, thankfully. Okay, that maybe not quite as funny. All right, uh, that, those are my only two jokes, and that's it. We'll go, we're, now we're on Psalm 91. <laughs> it's really hard, and you can't hear people. Um, so what I want to talk to you about this morning with reference to... Um, uh, that psalm, Psalm 91, is providence. In fact, Jason and I got to talking uh, on our trip on the trail. We talked a lot about providence, and we even had a title for the trip. I can't remember what it was now, the providential trip or something. We had a couple book titles, and uh, probably a couple of them weren't appropriate for church, but they, you know, we, we had some, some titles for, uh, for a book of, of how things were going. One of them had to do uh, with providence. And of course, this psalm is very closely related uh, to the whole idea of, of providence. So as I said before, um, this sermon is going to be a bit more personal uh, than most of my sermons. Um, and in that sense, it's more about me than most of my sermons are. Uh, but I want to start by saying, uh, I hope like any sermon, it's really not about me at all. Um, in the end, I think that's part of what makes the gospel good news. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's about God and who God is, uh, his love for us, his care for us. Uh, he's the one to whom all praises flow and in whom all glory rightfully exists. And so these stories from my life that I'm about to share with you are not, I, I hope you will see, I hope you'll understand, they're not stories I'm sharing, uh, you know, to make me look interesting or well-traveled or even devout. Uh, I don't care about those things. I, I hope you don't as well. Um, frankly, uh, I bore myself. I find myself to be, if you take away the blessings of God, I find myself to be a bit of a bore. Frankly, you take away the blessings of God, I imagine we're all quite dull, <laughs> you know. Um, it's, it's the Lord who's, uh, who fills things with life and interest and value. And so these stories are stories about me, to be sure, but they're ultimately stories about the Lord's providence and the Lord's care, and I hope that we can reflect together on his care for us um, uh, by sharing some of these stories. I love stories that tell of God's mercy. I mean, who doesn't? We all do. Stories that tell of God's mercy, stories that tell of his grace, and in this case, of his providence. Um, so I'm going to start, uh, start there. Uh, the, in the first part of the psalm, um, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. <clears throat> I will say of the Lord, he is my refuge and my fortress my God in whom I trust. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. Uh, just a note about this painting. Uh, can you all see the painting on the PowerPoint next to the Psalm? Okay. I just found that uh, recently, um, yesterday. It's a Dutch painter by the name of Krista Rosier. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. And she wasn't a painter, actually. She was a journalist, a Dutch journalist. And, uh, but she had a hobby of painting. And her son passed away when he was 14 years old. And she was, of course, devastated by this. And so she determined to draw, to pick some psalms having to do with grief and also God's care, God's providence, and she wrote, she did some paintings for like seven or eight different psalms. And one of them 
uh, was the psalm we're doing today, and, and this was the painting she did for it um, with the, the Hebrew word up there, meaning my refuge that's on the painting. So I just thought that was a beautiful image. And sadly, she passed away at a pretty young age um, of breast cancer in 2011 uh, to be with the Lord. But I, I love her paintings. So if you get the chance to look them up on, excuse me, online, Krista Rosier, uh, I just think they're they're very beautiful. All right here. So I did want to talk in terms of God's providence a bit about um, this hike Jason and I took on this trail. Um, Jason asked me if I was going to use it for sermon fodder. And I said, well, probably I'll intersperse it with various and different sermons. I didn't expect to be diving headfirst into it in the first Sunday, but it made sense with regard to thinking about God's providence. So Jason and I hiked the same trail on the same week, which made sense as we were going together. Uh, but we were having very different experiences on the trail, I think. Is that fair to say, Jason? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think we were both enjoying each other's company. I'll speak for myself. I was certainly enjoying Jason's company. He can speak to that privately to, to others. Uh, but only one of us was truly suffering. Uh, and, and it wasn't Jason. Uh, it's interesting, you know, five days goes by in a heartbeat uh, in a normal, at least in my life. I, I suspect it's true for many of you too. Five days goes by like that. I, I blink and there went a week. Uh, I measure my life often from sermon to sermon, and I cannot believe sometimes how quickly the next sermon has arrived. Um, I barely notice five days. My first day of hiking on this particular trail uh, felt like a week long all by itself. And I realized that my cardio, and in particular my knees and my general stamina, uh, were not as formidable as I had hoped, and that perhaps my treadmill work uh, had been somewhat in vain. Uh, the trail was more rugged than I anticipated. Um, if you want to get some idea of it, you can Google how to survive the West Coast Trail. That's an actual blog. Uh, and there, it, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty hardcore. Um, so I, after that first day, I was pretty worried. In fact, I was almost scared, borderline, because the shame, and I want to emphasize that word shame, the shame of being medevaced out would have been very real for me. By medevaced, I mean they have to send a helicopter or a boat to come take you off the trail. Uh, they average about 90 people uh, for every season, a season being four months. Every four months, roughly 90 people have to be medevaced out of the trail. So it's a, you know, it's it's not uncommon, shall we say. I would have joked about it because that's how I handle things, but it really would have eaten at me, to be honest. This was something I'd planned on doing for a while. I'd spent no small amount of money on it. I'd taken myself and Jason away from our wives and kids for a significant period of time, and I would have felt a lot of shame about tapping out. Related to that, if I did seriously injure my knee or my back by stubbornly pushing myself, um, my family members would not have been impressed by that uh, but rather would have had long-term consequences, um, and it would not be easy. I knew it would be hard. I knew there would be risks. I knew I was older than, much older than the last time I had backpacked. I honestly didn't know it was going to be that hard, and I didn't know quite how serious those risks would be. So on the one hand, I was pretty consistently physically exhausted, and when I would ask Jason if we could uh, stop and rest, I really wasn't asking. It was really a matter of, I can't walk anymore. You can keep walking, but there won't be anybody behind you anymore. Uh, it was the nature of that. Uh, my left knee had particular pain every time I had to bend it. And I was getting pretty worried about that. And uh, accompanying that, and I know you're going to think I'm being dramatic, but um, hear me out. Accompanying that was the fear of death, dying. Now, I have a fear of heights. It's a genuine phobia. And by that, I mean that it's uh, not always rational. You know, like if you're at the top of a building or an airplane, uh, the fear that bubbles up in me is not a rational one. I know I'm safe, but boy, my hands get sweaty, my knees shake. I, you know, my, I'm very scared of heights. But often what I experienced on the trail was not 
a phobia, but a very rational and fair assessment of the facts at hand that if I slip on this, you know, me being sweaty and shaky on this muddy rail or muddy log, um, there were a few times I could be absolutely assured if I slipped, I would die. Most times if I slipped, I figure I'd probably break a bone, maybe get beaten up pretty badly. But there were a few times where I could say, if I slip, I won't live through this. I remember the first day of the trail, there was, you know, it got real, the trail got very, very narrow, just a very thin slice of mud. And on the right hand side, there was basically just a sheer cliff. Uh, you know, it wasn't like there was a railing or, or you know, just it, you're right there. And it, you know, it's for me, that was just terrifying. So a combination of my phobia and then also just being a, a rational human being. So my brain was focused on my aging body and on my fear of a foolish or perhaps painful death. So there was that going on. And then our gear started breaking. The things that we were taking with us in order to survive uh, this arduous trip, which became uh, almost humorous. I think Jason would agree with this, that the, the, the degree to which our gear did not work uh, had a humorous flavor that especially in hindsight, but at the time was so pressing, it was difficult to laugh much about it, although I think we succeeded occasionally. Uh, the things that broke included uh, our propane tank, by which we were able to cook our food and boil water. Uh, the one pot that we bro brought food in, the handle broke off, so it was just a circular pot with no handle, which was really an uh, interesting challenge. Our two lighters uh, that we Bought, brought to start fire, you know, fire lighters, both broke or didn't work, uh, kind of a longer story, but that didn't work. And most seriously of all, uh, our water filter system, of which I had purchased a rather expensive one and had tested it on a previous camping trip, broke on the first day. So water and food were a problem and fire, water, food, fire. Uh, the tent didn't break, so shelter we had. But there was a moment there when I literally was thinking, are we going to have food to eat and water to drink? I'm not sure. Uh, it was it just it was up in the air. Also, just mysteriously, my watch stopped working, which had worked for the last several years. I don't even know why it did. Didn't drop it or anything. It just decided on this trip would be a good time for Seth to not be able to tell time. And so it decided to die, too. Um, so that. I'm painting a pretty bleak picture of this trip with uh, Jason, and it could have been a hellacious and devastating experience in any number of ways at any number of times, but it was not. It was fulfilling and it was in fact enjoyable uh, and um, full of God's grace. And so I wanna talk about God's providence, the provision of God that allowed this trip to be a blessing. And there are so many things I could talk about, I'll just, and I'll just run through them as quickly as I can here, but Vancouver Island is what's known as a temperate rainforest, which means it rains almost all the time there. We had five days and four nights of sunny, beautiful weather. And the reason that's important is not just for the, the joy of, of walking around in that kind of weather, but it was abundantly safer and easier. In fact, several times Jason and I would mention to each other, how do people even hike this trail while it's raining? I mean, it's already a mud fest. And it's already slippery as all get out. I mean, how do they even do that? <laughs> it was hard to get our head around. And that, for me, was a very necessary blessing to not have any rain. When our lighters broke, I was embarrassed. I was ashamed to ask anyone for their lighter or matches. When you're out there, other hikers are out there. I mean, fire is a survival thing. <laughs> it's deeply embarrassing to not have fire out there as a hiker. And it's like asking people for their lifeline, you know. And as it happens, that night we camped next to a group of, um, it turned out to be middle-aged mothers. They knew each other because their kids all went to the same uh, school. And they were very good hikers, uh, very experienced. And they were very kind. And I hope it doesn't sound sexist to say that they were kind of ma maternal and saw that we needed a little help. And uh, they gave us their emergency backup matches that they had in, in a waterproof container. And just there, they were just very, in fact, they tried to fix our pot too with some duct tape, it didn't work, doesn't matter, but they provided not just um, some needed practical help, but a little maternal comfort at, at the point for two lost boys. Well, one lost old man, one lost boy. 
Um, and that was that was very helpful and very kind. God's providence really shone through on that. When our propane tank suddenly started venting fuel at a high rate and so high that it got freezing cold, uh, we managed to work the top of the stove back onto the propane tank such that the gas wouldn't vent out anymore, although we weren't sure how much gas had vented out. And we were able to keep that on top through the rest of the trip, so we were able to have uh, fuel. The water filter was fixed through Providence alone. It broke on our first day. Uh, the lid would not seal on top of it. Every time you tried to pump water, it poured out. Now, as it happens, we were next to the river trying to filter the water with water going every which way, and this uh, German engineer came up. And if you want an engineer to come help you, you definitely want the German one. And this guy, uh, he didn't speak English very well, but he came up and he saw we were having trouble and he offered to help fix our water filter. So he took it apart and put it together two times uh, completely and both times it broke again. And he, he, the second time I was too embarrassed to go back to him and tell him because he'd spent, oh, I don't know, Jason, over an hour working on this. He was you know, just really trying hard to get this water filter to work. And I was embarrassed by it. And uh, anyway, I didn't even tell him. So I just started fiddling with it. I am not, by the way, a German engineer. Uh, I am actually uh, have all the opposite gifts. And I didn't, I didn't, I don't know what I did to it. I couldn't tell you. I was just messing with it. That's, that's how I fix things. I mess with them. Usually I break them more, but suddenly I heard it click and something popped and it worked from that point on. I was almost scared to touch it from that point on because I don't know how I fixed it. It just started working. Uh, so I fixed something a German engineer couldn't fix, which is going in my memoirs. I thought that was uh, pretty impressive. But in reality, I didn't do anything. I mean, it was at the point where I was just really just praying, God, <laughs> I really need this water filter to work. And it worked. Providence. I left Vancouver Island without any serious injury to my body. I left without being dehydrated. I left actually fairly well fed with potato soup because every problem that we had was providentially provided for in some way or shape. I was completely drained in body and in spirit, but that's what a challenge is for, right? I went out there for a challenge and it felt good to give my everything to this trip. I never slipped off a log. I never even broke my skin on a sharp rock or a thorn. I have bruises all over my legs, which Jason never got, which I think is a weird thing that I got bruises and Jason didn't. I mean, that's very odd. I don't know how we we compared legs at one point. I was like, what? How are you not banging into rocks? <laughs> Just doesn't make sense. Doesn't matter. I left having seen some of the most beautiful beaches and coves in the world, literally. And I left with my dignity more or less intact. Maybe not in the eyes of some of the fellow hikers, but at least in my own eyes, I left covered in God's providence. And some might look at me and say, there goes a very, very lucky man. But I don't think I'm, I'm lucky at all. I think I'm loved. I think I'm loved by God and that I was saved by providence. And slides uh, two and three, this part from the Psalms there, surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. I believe I've been experiencing God's providence since before I was born. Um, I believe some of these babies we're waiting for in the church are experiencing God's providence in the womb. I've told some of these stories before, but I wanted to repeat them here. I think because for me, the hardest part of my life, for some people, well, at least I should say the hardest part of my life to date uh, my life not being over. But for me, the hardest part of my life was my childhood uh, for various reasons and things. But um, And the idea of God being with me through all that is immensely comforting to me, even in, especially in the hardest times. And I know I've talked about it before, but I always wonder at it because, you know, my parents named me Seth Judson, uh, which the combination of 
Hebrew means one who is appointed the son of worship, the appointed son of worship. Seth meaning appointed, Jud, coming from Yud, Judah, to praise. Um, so the appointed son of praise. I always think about that. My mother, from the time she was a child, knew that if she had a son, she would name him Seth, but she never knew where she got the name from. She had no friends or family members with the name Seth. She just had in her mind she would name her son Seth. And it turns out, even though I was raised an atheist, worship has been a large part of my experience and a significant aspect of how I even came to faith in Christ. And it gives me great encouragement that God has been walking with me since the very beginning, since before the beginning for my life. Another story about God's provision for me and his presence in very hard times was when I was born. And I've talked about this before. I've made jokes about it. But the truth is, it's to me, it's like a love letter from God that on the day that I was born, I was born on Washington Island in Wisconsin, Sturgeon Bay. There's a small island there in the bay. And when I was born on that island, they rang the church bells, which is very odd for me because my parents are atheists. And, you know, we had nothing to do with the church. Uh, in fact, if anything, uh, push the church away. And I like the idea of music being played in a place of worship on the day that I was born, as if God was saying, a son of worship. To me, that feels providential. Uh, it feels like a love letter from God. The next place my family moved to was Cincinnati, Wisconsin, near the Illinois border, kind of near Galena. My parents had very little money at that time, uh, very little anything. And there was a convent there of nuns. Uh, still is a convent there, up near there, near Cincinnati. And they let my family stay in one of their houses for free. My mother says they were very kind and hospitable. God's people caring for me before I could even speak, before I could walk. And that house was heated by a wood-burning stove, which caught the house on fire and burned down the whole house. And almost with me and my sister in it, it happened very fast from what I hear. My dad was able to get my sister and I out before it burned down. And then we really had nothing and we had no insurance. And the nuns didn't hold it against us or anything. They blessed us, they sent us on our way. Grace and generosity from the servants of the Lord, providence. And so the story went on. I'm not going to go through my life story, but for every setback and every disaster, there was providence. There was God's mercy. He will cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you will find refuge. And his faithfulness was not predicated on my faithfulness. He was faithful to me even before I knew his name. He was faithful when I was aggressively unfaithful to him. I did not know much about God or his people, much less his son, when I was growing up. All I knew was that he was a false god, and people were delusional to believe those mythologies. My friends and I readily mocked anything to do with God or Jesus, which is easy to do because, you know, in a, when I was growing up, everything from Saturday Night Live to grunge bands to the most popular movies are all trying to see who can mock Jesus the most, and I was happy to join in. It was during that time that I went out to sea with my mother and my stepfather for a year in the South Pacific. I've told this story many times before, too. Two times the ocean tried to claim me as a victim. Both times involved stormy weather on the water. The first time was the more terrifying, but the second time makes for the better story, as it was a lightning bolt at sea that nearly sunk our boat, even knocked us unconscious for a brief period of time. And the providence of God in those moments is breathtaking to me. I'm not going to rehash those stories, but the number of things that had to happen, the number of unusual occurrences that had to happen in a certain order for me to be sitting here right now, alive, speaking, is overwhelming to me. It's overwhelming. The providence of God. A thousand may fall at your right side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. You will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked. In that, in that verse that I just read, there is a kind of providence in this walk with Christ that is difficult to verbalize without sounding cruel or apathetic. But it's real, 
<clears throat> and I believe it's alluded to here in the psalm, and it's a providence I've experienced. It's also alluded to in the parable of the sower, but I won't read that one here. If you are blessed to have any longevity in this life as a Christian, then I suspect you've seen a thousand fall at your side, 10,000 at your right hand. People from your church or from your family, from your seminary, perhaps. People you worshipped with, people you took communion with, falling away, falling away from the faith for many reasons. You know, the worries of this world, the allure, perhaps, of living your own life, living your best life now, wealth, power, maybe simply the lack of a deeply rooted faith that was easily plucked up by a competing belief or plucked away by a painful experience. People fall away. And you may ask, where is the providence in that? Where do I see the providence in that? I it may seem like a strange thing to focus on in the psalm, but there is such providence in there for me. What does it mean in verse 8 when it says, you will only observe with your eyes and see the punishment of the wicked as people fall along the way? Well, there's a kind of distance implied there, an emotional distance, when you only observe with your eyes, right? So consider this image in the psalm with me. It's the image of a soldier going into battle with his fellow soldiers on either side of him. They're all on the same side, battling, fighting the same enemy. But his fellow soldiers are being slaughtered on the battlefield, on his left and on his right. And normally, this would cause, you would think it would cause and bring to bear intense grief, anguish, Survivor's guilt, uh, PTSD, sometimes we refer to it uh, in, in the military. But the soldier in this psalm only sees with his eyes. And what is more, he sees God's justice at work. He sees a purpose. He's not uncaring. He's not a sociopath. He trusts the Lord. He's going to fight the battle, even if he's going to end up alone at the end. I think this passage is reminiscent of some of our passages we've talked about in Revelation, where God's justice and his punishments come with songs of praise, with hymns of glory being sung by the angels and by the saved, while the wages of sin are being paid in full. This is a strange thing, and it is difficult to talk about, and but there is so much providence here and has been in my life that because the Lord is the, the center of that which I love and because the Lord is the center of that which gives me faith and hope that I am never disappointed and I'm never to despair. And I wonder sometimes if this is one of the reasons that Christians, people who follow Jesus are so well-suited, not just called, because we are called, but also well-suited to work with and to assist uh, the homeless, the mentally ill, people who have become addicted to drugs, those who have been ground down by the sins of this world and become shells of their former selves, we're able to apply ourselves with compassion and hope to hopeless situations, not because we think we're going to fix everything and make it better, because we trust the final outcome in all things to God's mercy. Whether a thousand fall on my left and 10,000 on my right, I trust that God's mercy, God's judgment, God's sovereignty in the end are true. We do not trust in the end in our own work, but in God's. That is providence. I cannot heal every hurt. I cannot right every wrong, but God can. We are not the judge of each other's souls. God is. We are not the final bringers of justice. All we can do is watch with our eyes and trust the Lord day to day. When we see people come to faith and new life springs forth, I can rejoice, you can rejoice, we do rejoice. And when people fall away from the Lord and embrace empty idols, I will sorrow, you will sorrow, but we will not despair. The Lord is where my faith and my deepest love reside, not in my brothers and sisters, for I would make an idol out of you and it would ruin us.
And the older I get, the more precious this aspect of providence does appear to me as it protects me and keeps me light of heart. If you say the Lord is my refuge and you make the most high your dwelling, no harm will overtake you. No disaster will come near your tent, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. You will tread on the lion and the cobra. You will trample the great lion and the serpent. I thought that was a great passage for the West Coast Trail, that no disaster came near our tent. We did not strike our feet against a stone. And we even saw a serpent that Jason chased off the trail. <laughs> <clears throat> because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. He will call on me, and I will answer him. I will be with him in trouble. I will deliver him and honor him. With long life, I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. And I will end with just a quick reflection on that last part of the psalm. <clears throat> um, I told Jason on the trail, and it's true that I am always praying. I always, I'm in a constant conversation with God in my mind all the time. I feel like I'm just always speaking to God. But in a way, sometimes I think I use that as an excuse to never call on the Lord. It says in verse 15, he will call on me and I will answer him. And to call on the Lord is not the same as just to be in a constant conversation with God. And I noted on this trip, and I note in my life that I have a, I have a, a method for dealing with trouble in my life, and that is to bring all of my power and will and, and strength and gifts to bear to fix the problem, and then when all that fails, then I will call on the Lord. And I'm contemplating switching those around <laughs> to save myself some time. I'm contemplating trying to be more intentional about just calling on the Lord right away, as opposed to waiting till the 11th hour. And maybe I, maybe I will, who knows what who knows if I'll succeed in that? But I think it's true that there is something about calling on the Lord and his providence that he is waiting sometimes for us to call on him. And so my encouragement to you is if there is a thing in your life that you're always talking to the Lord about and you could use some providence, I hope my testimonies and this psalm will encourage you to call on the Lord. And that looks different for different people. But just in a very simple way to get on your knees, to lift your hands and say, Lord Jesus, I'm at a loss and I don't know what to do, but I know that your providence is real and I will trust you. Amen. Now's our time of communion. It seems strange to not be able to be here and lead you into it in person, but let me say a prayer. And then uh, we will go to communion together. If you're in a relationship with the Lord, the table's in the back and on the side, and we invite you to his supper. Lord Jesus, I thank you for the ways that in the lives of all of us gathered here, that you have sheltered us, that you have covered us with your wings and protected us from the, 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 the slings and arrows of this world. And Lord, teach us to be a people that cry out to you, knowing that your providence is sufficient. We know, Lord, that we are but passing through here. We know that we are but a vapor on this earth. We know that our time here is short. But we ask, Lord, that you would give us times and experience of your grace and of your mercy and of your providence, such that we can give glory to you and show other people who are lost that your glory is real and true and eternal. We thank you, Lord, that your sacrifice on the cross is what caused this to be, what makes this possible. So help us to go to the table now with hearts full of gratitude and of expectation of the glory that you will bring when we call on you. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat>